All right. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Humor and Games in the Adult Education Classroom. Today's webinar is generously sponsored by Essential Education, and today we have Dan Griffith with us, who is going to share some words. Dan? Thanks. Thanks, James. Let me share my screen real quick here. There we go. Um, appreciate everybody being here today. We're excited to sponsor this uh, webinar. We love talking about humor in the classroom and, uh, and just making the classroom as engaging as possible. I'm sure that Emma will touch on some of the great research that's been done that shows the impact of humor on learning. Uh, at Essential Education, we're all about trying to change lives, making sure that people have the most efficient pathway through content. Uh, today, just a couple of things that we offer free that uh, you might be interested in. One is um, we do have some uh, professional development courses that would align with this, our Motivating the Adult Learner and Blended Learning in Adult Education. And then we also have a um, free uh, teacher toolkit. Uh, and you can go to essentialed.com slash educators slash get dash toolkit to get that. And there's all kinds of cool activities on there. Uh, for keeping students engaged. In just a second, I'm gonna pull up a screen with a, a QR code on it. So if you have your phone out um, and have a QR code reader, or if you have an Apple iPhone, uh, one of the later models, it's built automatically into the camera. If you have an Android, you might have to have a QR reader uh, as well, but, but pull that up because I'm gonna show you that in just a second. But I wanted to point out something on our website that goes directly with today's presentation, which is if you come to essentialed.com slash educators and come over to our professional development section, you'll see um, that teacher toolkit is listed here so you can access that. There's information about our uh, professional development courses, our distance learning series. And if you click on Tuesdays with Essential Education, this is our um, webinar series that we do on a regular basis. It's now bi-monthly. And if you scroll down just a bit, you can see the webinars. And there's all kinds of free uh, webinars on here. Um, we've got all of our past sessions up here. So things like our digital toolbox and relax, refresh, and recharge. And if you click on view all past sessions and scroll down to the very bottom, We've done a presentation that we did a while back, and I've done it in a number of co-aves called Laughing for Learning, the Power of Humor uh, in Education. And so that would be a nice, um, if you really like what Emma does today and want to see maybe some other things or a different perspective, I don't know her presentation, but uh, that would be another enrichment activity that you could do in alignment with uh, what she's doing to extend that uh, workshop. So um, let me just pull up this uh, QR code if y'all are interested at all in um, getting a demo or uh, anything like that with Essential Education, you can scan that QR code off your cell phone right now. It'll pull up a link where you can sign up for a demo with one of our sales reps. We can connect to you with uh, information about any of our products and services. And we hope you enjoyed today's uh, presentation, get a good laugh or two out of it. And uh, thanks again to our partners at COE for the opportunity to sponsor. All right, Dan, thank you so much. We are grateful for uh, Essential Education support and friendship. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in Seattle next month for COE 2022. Absolutely. All right, thanks, Dan. Okay, so today our presenter is Emma Berg. She is an adult education instructor with the North Dakota Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. She has been teaching ABE classes at the Missouri River Correctional Center, North Dakota's minimum security prison for adult men for almost eight years. She holds a degree in special education and business education, a lifelong North Dakota resident. She enjoys planning celebrations for family and friends, reading books about North Dakota history, and taking cross country road trips with her husband. Please welcome her by saying hello in the chat box. Let us know where you're calling in from today. If you have questions during your presentation, you can submit those in the Q&A box. And with that, I'll turn it over to Emma. All right, thank you. Thank you. Give me just a minute and we'll get situated by sharing my screen.
Right. Mm, very cool to see where everybody is from. Thank you for sharing. So as James said, uh, my name is Emma Berg and I'm an adult education instructor at the Missouri River Correctional Center in Bismarck, North Dakota. That's the state capital, kind of in central North Dakota. Um, I wanna share a few details about the facility that I work at, just so you have a little better understanding of what my classroom is like and who my students are. The Missouri River Correctional Center is the minimum security prison in the North Dakota prison system. Our maximum capacity at our prison is about 180 residents. And in education, we serve anywhere from 15 to 30 students in our education department. That's um, individuals who come into prison who do not have a high school diploma or a GED. And GED is the only high school equivalency option in North Dakota. And throughout the day, I teach six different classes, one hour each throughout the day. Four of them are math classes. One of them is a reading class. Um, we're going through star reading training, if any of you are uh, familiar with star reading. And I also teach an elective class, financial literacy. So that's kind of what my day consists of um, and what our education department looks like. I have one colleague that works with me and she teaches more of the social studies and reading classes. So today the resources and ideas I'm going to share with you are all things that I've tried and used in my classroom and most of them several times. Um, I'm certainly not here to tell you that I'm the expert in any of this, but rather today I'd like to provide you some encouragement and hopefully spark some new ideas for you to bring back to your classroom. If you have questions as we move through the presentation, please feel free to utilize the chat box. I do have that open on the screen. I will do my best to answer questions as we move along. Um, have a little grace with me, please. I'm just a classroom teacher working through this webinar. So um, if I don't get to you right away, feel free to reach out to me by email. I'll share my email at the end of this. Um, and that's always an option as well. I'm happy to um, share resources and connect and collaborate with all of you. Uh, I have given this presentation previously, both at our regional conference, uh, we're part of MPAEA, and also at the COE virtual conference last year. And both times I really enjoyed being able to share resources, but also to get ideas from all of you. So today, as we go through things, um, feel free to share your ideas in the chat box as well. If, if I bring up a topic and you're like, oh, I've done that in the classroom, absolutely, please throw it out there because the more we can collaborate and learn from each other, the better. I also want to preface this with the understanding that I know I've been able to do some things that you might go, how in the world does she do that? She works in corrections, she works at a prison. Uh, obviously there are security concerns with everything. And so many of the lessons and project, projects featured here required special approval from my supervisor, uh, from the principal, from the deputy warden, from the warden before I was allowed to do them. So, what I say to that is don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to reach out and say, hey, this is a really cool idea. How could we maybe make that happen? Um, you just never know what that answer might be. Case in point for us, we thought it was crazy five years ago. We're like, why can't we take our guys on a field trip? Wouldn't it be great if we could take our, our students on a field trip? And guess what? Now we take quarterly field trips off property to places like our state museum, to state historical sites, to state parks. Um, it's fabulous. So uh, if that's, if you get nothing else from this, I hope that, you know, just a little inspiration to not be afraid to ask those questions and see where that might take you. All right, so in North Dakota government, uh, we kind of have three themes that we work off of. The, and all three of them, I feel like are, are really powerful for us in adult education. They could be our themes as well. Um, empowering people. So making connections, forming relationships, that's so important in our classrooms, right? It's so important to empower adult learners to get involved, to advocate for themselves, to ask good questions, and to be curious about learning. Improving lives. Obviously, humor and having positive professional relationships in the classroom definitely improves both student lives and teachers' lives. Um, those connections help to foster learning as well. 
it's really important for us to always remember that we are role models for our students um, and we need to be their biggest cheerleader and we wanna encourage positive thinking. And the third theme is inspiring success. Uh, we don't wanna give up our, on our students. We wanna to work to find solutions for them. Uh, we wanna inspire that success for them, which means teaching them about growth mindset, teaching them about grit, teaching them problem solving skills and strengthening their ability to overcome obstacles. And I know you all are probably going, yeah, there's that one student that, oh my gosh, like the most challenging student, right? Let me tell you, I had that student a year and a half ago and he pushed me and tested me in every way possible. And we made it through. He kept saying, I will never pass the math test. I will never learn math. I've never been able to do it. And you know what, guess what? He passed that test with a really nice score and earned his GED. So sometimes you have to find <laughs> your own support in those situations. Like to me, it was my colleague who stood by me the whole time and helped me to not give up on that, that student. How do games and fun activities add to those three themes? Well, they foster healthy competition. Students learn to work together and to help each other. Uh, I'm often surprised how during the middle of a game, Students help each other with problems and teach each other skills. And although it's a competitive environment and maybe we're keeping score a little bit, they realize learning is more important than being the person with the highest score. And games and activities also lighten the mood, provide that fun classroom environment. Uh, many times games involve kinesthetic learning opportunities, learning with your hands, which is sometimes the most difficult type of lesson to incorporate. Um, can be especially helpful to adult learners. And they also provide a real life connection between learning and life outside of school. Teacher conducted research indicates that games can have a significant effect on student achievement when teachers use them purposefully and thoughtfully. Here are some things to keep in mind when adding games into your lesson plans. In general, Students like to compete as long as the stakes are not too high. I think that's true for anyone in life, right? In my classroom, we try to keep the atmosphere light. We award prizes at the end of the game to everyone who played along. Sometimes there's a little bit better prizes for those that won versus those that didn't. But ultimately, it's not really about the prize. So we just make it goofy. We give out things like pencils and erasers and highlighters, um, things like that that they could use in the classroom. As with all lessons, it is important to focus on the skill and the content being studied. That might be a little bit common sense, but I felt like I needed to say that. <laughs> Sometimes games can just, we can get carried away a little bit, even as teachers. Uh, games are absolutely fun, but they do need to be centered around the content being taught in the lesson. Uh, the most common mistake that teachers make when playing games in the classroom is to tally the score and simply move on. We should take time to go over questions that students struggled with. We should take time to answer their questions. In fact, a lot of times I do this while the students are playing. I might walk around the room and monitor what they're doing. Um, maybe a round or two of their game that they're playing at their desk. Might ask them some clarifying questions. If it's something that's more than a classroom game, then I'm usually the person moderating it. Uh, more of a classroom game, then I'm usually the person mod uh, moderating it. In that case, I might stop the game occasionally, add explanations when needed, might add supporting information when I see students struggling. Uh, you do need to be a little careful. I just played games with my students on Wednesday. We played a Jeopardy game and they were yelling at me during the game because you need to be careful that you're not giving one team an unfair advantage by giving out too much information that helps one team and doesn't help the other. So <laughs> we have fun with that in my classroom. If your students are note takers, or if you've had them take some notes, it might be helpful to give them an opportunity to go back to their notes after they've played their game. I'm, I typically use games in my classroom as an assessment of student learning at the end of a lesson. Um, I don't give quizzes or tests. I just don't find them as effective uh, for my teaching style or for my students. But instead, I like to use games and activities as, as an assessment guide uh, to guide my instruction and evaluate how well my students have learned certain skills. All right, 
So there's the why behind all of it. Now let's dig into some of the fun games and activities that I've personally used in my classroom on a regular basis. Again, at any time, if you have a question or want to add a lesson idea or a fun thought, please shoot it out into the comment, uh, into the chat box as a comment. Again, I can't guarantee I'll see everything, but I do plan to stop periodically to check the chat box. All right. So the first thing might seem a little obvious, but a deck of cards. Here are some ways that you can incorporate a deck of playing cards into a math lesson. Um, I've come across an interesting way to practice mean, median, mode, and range. It really isn't anything fancy. It's really just telling them, all right, deal yourself five cards. Now use these numbers on these cards and calculate the mean, the mean, the median, the mode, and the range, or which, whichever of them you want to calculate, right? Adds a little novelty other than just writing numbers up on the board. Um, one that my students really like to play is war. Um, if you're not familiar with war, you basically deal out the cards into two stacks. Each player, it's a partner game, so each player would flip over a card. And then um, we've played this like adding integers. So red cards are negative and black cards are positive. Um, and then they have to either add them together, subtract them, multiply them. Dividing doesn't work as well, um, but they really enjoy that. The activity fosters healthy competition, gets students interested in learning by allowing them to play a game that most of them enjoy playing. Uh, I've even played war for things like percentages using specially made cards for the game. So anything really that you could um, do like a, a, a two stacks and pair them up and then, you know, this and this and then make something with it um, could work. So even those of you who maybe teach a reading class or an RLA class, maybe you wanna have them practice writing sentences with verbs and nouns. So you have one stack that's verbs and one stack that's nouns and you pick from that. So use your imagination, anything that like that, you could use this kind of a game for. So if you've used a deck of cards in your classroom, feel free to share out in the chat box the types of things that maybe you've used cards for. The next thing that I'd like to share is using dominoes. Ah, multiplication, see, good. Thank you for sharing. I've used dominoes for things like fractions. In fact, I've used that quite a bit um, over the last few years. And uh, with fractions, you can either, you know, use them however they, however they turn up. So using proper and improper, like there's lots of different accommodations you could make here. You can take some of the dominoes out so there aren't as many high, high level numbers in there. Um, so you could really specify which fractions you want the student to work on with, and by using those dominoes. Um, that's been really successful. So like, you know, setting up dominoes and saying, okay, now multiply these two together. Um, I've done that before as well. Sometimes I include templates for the students to use, like a placemat where they can set them on and then it has a multiplication sign in between. Um, a lot of times I've used that for lower level students or students who are struggling with executive functioning and like organization. Um, so I don't always do it, but it is an option um, to give them that. Being that it's a hands-on activity, it's great for so many learners. I've also come across other dominoes that don't use the traditional domino set, but have that kind of feel to the activity. Um, so if you can see this one I've got in my hand, there's a whole set of dominoes and they have a question and they have an answer. And so you have to, here's the start one. You could start with this one and you figure out, you know, what is the answer to the perimeter of this shape? Find it on whatever domino is next. I don't know, I haven't looked, I'm just guessing. <laughs> if this was the answer, then here would be your next question. And eventually when you're finished, you should be able to line all of these up on your desk in order. I really like things like this because it isn't just making the student do all of the work and not giving them any assistance with, with answer choices. Um, at least here, they have a whole bank of, of choices for answers to pick from. And as they get to the end, they're gonna realize, hmm, if I don't have the answer I need, maybe I have something wrong further back. 
uh, they can do a lot of error analysis that way as well. Mm -hmm. mm, Diane, I like that idea too. Using it for reducing lowest common denominator. Yep, or even ratio problems. Yeah, that's very good. See, you guys are starting to think this is good. <laughs> um, I also, I have some domino sets, just like those ones I showed you that have equations on them. So really, there's a lot of things out there. I should have prefaced at the beginning too, like so many of these things, are things that I just came across and maybe I've altered them a little bit for myself, but I can't take credit for being the original person who came up with all of these ideas. Like obviously um, I'm pulling from a lot of people, a lot of great teachers who've already come before me and, and um, found these ideas. So what I'm presenting to you today is really just what I know works in my classroom um, and kind of putting it all together into one presentation to share and hopefully inspire you to try some of it. Um, all right, let me go back and see. Does that help? Someone was asking to see. Oh, you can't see me. I don't know how to fix that. So <laughs> you might have to play. If you can't see me, you might have to play with some of the view settings on your own screen. Let's see if you can figure that out. Um, Okay, so yes, anything that's a question and then some answers, you could line up, you know, line them up. Um, yeah, specific instructions. I could have shared that too. I have a whole resource file prepared for you. Um, and I will share that at the end. So there's a whole thing, I don't know how many, 50 or 75 different things in there um, that you can, you can check out. So I like these dominoes, they may or may not be in there depending upon where I got it from. Um, some of the things on Teachers Pay Teachers, even if they're free downloads, the people who posted them there would prefer that you go to Teachers Pay Teachers and download it from them. So I was um, trying to be mindful of that. So hopefully I didn't get uh, any copyrighted material added into my file. If, you, if I did, oops, sorry, you'll have to forgive me. <laughs> um, but yes, there's a whole resource page that I will share with you at the end. All right, next thing, coloring activities. Some of my students are really artistic and I enjoy working with them on math projects where they can incorporate those artistic talents. There are a lot of color by number activities out there. Some of them I've found to be too basic, maybe a little bit too kiddish for my adult students. Uh, the ones I'm sharing here and the, the ones I've uploaded into the resources at the end um, have been pretty well received in my classroom. If you look closely at the top picture, you can see the student has one page with mean, median, mode, and range questions. And then the bottom page has spaces and shapes with numbers. And um, it's like whatever answer they get to their mean, median, mode, range question, then they're supposed to color that in a certain color on their answer sheet. Um, if this is a fun activity, I really enjoy doing it, but it does take a little bit of time to color that in. So just be prepared for that. If you choose to do a color by number, remember it takes time for them to do the coloring. <laughs> Another math lesson that involves coloring um, is, is based on a painting called Colors for a Large Wall that hung in the Metropolitan Art Gallery in uh, New York City. The artist took individual canvases painted them in solid colors and arranged them in a pattern on the wall. Uh, so you can see in the bottom picture here, you can see some of the patterns that my students have created. We take a 10 by 10 table and I tell them to color in blocks, either in a pattern or randomly, however they would like to do it. And then I have the students count how many squares of each color they have, and then calculate that as a fraction, as a decimal, and as a percentage, um, a percentage of that table. And then we display them, of course, for everybody to check out. So that one is always really fun. I've done that one lots and lots of times. I also recently found a coloring activity related to Pythagorean theorem. It was interesting, it was actually a, a choice activity as well where they, they had two or three different problems they could choose from. And the whole point was I need them to draw an illustration that illustrated their problem. And then they would need to come up to the board, show it to their classmates and explain their process to it. 
Um, I was really pumped about this one because when I said, could you go up and share? Everybody was really excited to go up and really didn't need any prompting for me to get up to the board. So um, those are always great days as a teacher. So if you have done any coloring activities with your students, feel free to share that in the chat box. Another game that we play all of the time is bingo. You can make bingo games for almost anything. Anything that has kind of a matching component to it, you can make bingo for. So we play bingo for slope questions, um, asking slope find the slope of this line, show them a line and ask them what the slope is and they have to find it on their board, right? Improper fractions, maybe you show them a mixed number and they have to find the improper fraction or vice versa. You can do this for order of operations, ask them an order of operations question, the answer is on their bingo board someplace. Uh, that one I do believe is in the resource file for you. Fractions, decimals, percent, same kind of thing. Give them the fraction, ask them to find the decimal equivalent. Equations, ask them a question that's an equation question, ask them to find the answer on their bingo card. Um, we even have a version for civics uh, where we ask a civics question and then they have to find the answer on their board. We do have, yes, good. <laughs> Sylvia's agreeing, bingo works every time. Um, civics, bingo where, um, ask a civics question, they have to find the answer. We do have a civics requirement in the state of North Dakota. Uh, so it's a great way to review for that as well. Um, again, I will say, I hardly ever make my own bingo cards. Just Google slope bingo, fraction bingo, like whatever kind of bingo you want. I bet you somebody out there is sharing it with the world and is happy for you to use the version that they have created. Mm, that's an interesting concept. Um, drawing activity to teach dangling and misplaced modifiers in sentences. So like um, teaching grammar and then having the people, having your students interpret the meaning of the sentence by drawing it in a picture. I really like that idea. That's cool. Very nice. Thank you guys for sharing. See, this is exactly what we need, learning from each other. In, in my special ed mind, I'm always thinking about, right, how do I kind of scaffold things a little bit, making um, challenging, challenging some students and, and bridging the gap so that everybody's kind of in the same place. And so uh, with bingo, that would be easy to do just by limiting the number of spaces on the board. Um, if you had a lower group of students, maybe don't give them 25 boxes, maybe give them four by four and make it a 16. Just be thinking about those things as well. Jeopardy is something that I've really gotten into playing. And there's a website out there that um, I would promote. It's jeopardylabs.com. And if you have never heard of jeopardylabs.com, you've got to check it out. <laughs> there are so many Jeopardy games out there that have been created by teachers like, like you and me. Um, I've I've made a few of my own on the website, but usually I just have to search and bing, it pops up. Um, yeah, Jeopardy Labs is, is amazing. Um, you tally the scores, like the, the picture you're seeing here is actually a screenshot of Jeopardy Labs. So um, you can see like you can keep score at the bottom uh, very easily that way. Hmm, she can't hear me. If anybody else is having trouble hearing me, shoot it into the chat box. Hopefully it's, hopefully it's just a isolated incident. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> you know, presenting at a webinar is so different than uh, presenting in person. Like, I feel like I'm talking to you all and connecting with you all, but all I can see are little words. <laughs> It's very, it's very different. So thank you for writing um, and interacting with me. Makes it a little easier for me. Uh, so yes, Jeopardy, you can see my list. Played a lot of different types of Jeopardy. Oh, I really like Jennifer's idea. She says she has her students create their own boards, 
by giving them the answers and asking them to fill up the card in any way they choose. Yep. Um, I could see, I don't know if you meant by that, that you would have them like write their own questions as well, but I could see myself taking that a step further and having them actually take a day or two and write their own questions to get ready for the bingo game. But yeah, if you're saying you just have them fill it out, I agree. I have them do that as well. A lot of times I'm just giving them a blank bingo card and then they're filling it out um, for bingo as far as that goes. Very good. All right, well, let's talk about something that's even more exciting and that is science experiments. Let me, uh, let me type that Jeopardy lab in here for you. So you've got it. So my students really enjoy the time that we spend on science experiments. Um, most people, <laughs> I think all of you would agree that when you do science experiments in the classroom, it's really well received. Uh, I wanna give you a general overview of how I set these up to maximize the learning opportunities. And then I'll give you a few details on the experiments that I have listed here. This has taken me like, um, like they said in my introduction, I've, I've been teaching in adult ed for eight years now. So it's taken me a little while to kind of fine tune this and figure out the process. Um, but now I'm, I'm pretty happy with how I set up experiments. Um, so see if this helps you at all with, with organizing your lessons. So many of the science experiments that, that you see on the screen here and that I'll kind of highlight came about because the students were curious about something and started asking questions. In some instances, their questions led directly to the experiment that we performed. And I always keep in mind that for the GED test, students need to have a good understanding of the steps of an experiment and the vocabulary that goes along with that experiment. We typically spend four to five class days working on any given experiment. Yes, we do these experiments in prison. Yes, that's why I said at the beginning, a lot of these things that I did as experiments, I definitely had to ask for permission and I had to kind of go through the whole process of what is involved, what am I allowed to bring in, what am I allowed to use, um, how am I going to, like yeast, right? Obviously can be used to make hooch, um, make alcohol. So we wanna be careful and be very controlled with that. So yes, <laughs> you do have to kind of have a process and be careful um, and ask for permission with all of this. <clears throat> so on the first day, we're probably gonna learn some background information about the question so we can gain a better understanding of what we're going to be learning about in our experiment. So let's take like the properties of yeast. I've done this one several times. The first day we're just learning about like what in the world is yeast? What is a fungus? What is like all of this stuff that, um, that has to do with yeast? Um, why is it used in bread? Those kinds of questions. On the second day, we talk explicitly about the scientific method. Um, I use a, some videos to do that. Uh, we kind of just walk through those steps and talk about what that might look like. On the third day, we take that scientific method and we write down the steps to our own experiment. We really work to outline the variables and the controls in our experiment. Um, if you teach science and you're familiar with the science GED test, you know how important like independent and dependent variables and controls are to understanding. There's usually a question about that, excuse me, and it's kind of a tricky thing to understand. Um, so <clears throat> I have the students do the work here. They have the five steps of the experiments or however many, sometimes it varies depending upon what book you're using. Um, they have those steps and they have to work through and figure out like what question are they asking? What is their hypothesis? Right. How are they going to collect the results? All of those kinds of things. And I even make them tell me what supplies they're going to need. Obviously, my teacher mind, I know what they're going to need, but I make them work through that and tell me, uh, tell me what they're going to need for that. On the fourth day, we spend time actually walking to the experiment. The first few times I did this, I'm like, oh, we're kind of spoiling it. Like, that's not going to be a surprise. But it makes so much it makes it so much easier. Um, when they know what to expect, 
when we talked about like you're going to put the sugar into this bottle with this amount of water and that 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 so um it, it just makes things flow and makes the learning process better and then the fifth day we get to actually do the experiment um if you look in the bottom right hand corner those of you in corrections you can dream about this and you can figure out how are you going to propose to your supervisor that you can do this. The properties of yeast experiment ends with us actually getting to go to the kitchen and do more of a facts lesson where we make pizza dough, we let it rise, we make our pizzas, we put them in the oven and we actually get to eat homemade pizza. Um, this was, this is one of my favorite ones and it started with students going, you need to bring us pizza, you need to bring us pizza. And anybody in, in this group here who has worked in corrections, I bet they've been approached and said, oh, I wish you could bring us this, or I wish you could bring us that, jokingly, right? So I said, well, how can we make this pizza work? Um, and we came up with this idea and our supervisor approved it. So um, don't be afraid to ask those questions. We've also gone outside and done the Diet Coke and Mentos challenge. Um, one time our students were reading about owls. We're very interested in owls. So we got some owl pellets to dissect. Um, we've done oobleck, which now the word escapes me what kind of liquid it is. Non-Newtonian fluid, I think is what it's called. Um, anybody here who, who knows for sure, you can, uh, you can throw that in the chat box. Um, yeah, it makes a very interesting liquid with like cornstarch. Uh, I should have looked at this before the presentation, sorry. <laughs> I haven't done this one in a while. But this one is out there as well. Ublek is really fun to make and it makes this funky, like silly putty-ish kind of a liquidy, solidy thing. And it's, it's very cool. Um, we've dyed Easter eggs, testing uh, how much vinegar. Yes, thank you. People are posting in the chat about what it's called. Thank you. <laughs> um, the Easter egg, we, the question was, what's the best amount of vinegar to add to the water? Um, and we've also tested like what kind of fluid, what kind of liquid best dissolves a candy cane. Um, so any of those basic science experiments are great. Really what you're, what you're teaching your students is the steps of the experiment and those vocabulary words, so. Mm -hmm. Bringing in leaves. Mm -hmm. I've I did that myself as a student, so that's a great idea too. And that would be pretty easy for most of us. That's a great idea. I feel like there was a question up here that I wanted to answer. Was it about, someone had asked what was that strip on the desk? Um, that strip of paper, like on the Easter egg picture, you can see in the top right, that strip is like a, Oh, like a name plate that, that you might put on like an elementary student's desk. This one was printed by Scholastic years ago. And unfortunately, I tried to reorder them a few years ago and I couldn't find them. So if you can find them, great, but I think they're kind of hard to come by now. Uh, but it's basically just one of those strips you'd put on the top of somebody's desk and they can write their name on it. Uh, but it also has a multiplication chart, has a globe. It has like measurements. Um, some grammar information, really, really helpful in the math classroom. So, oh, there's a Dr. Seuss story about Ublek. This is interesting. I might have to look into that. So yes, those, those name tag things, if you can find one that has like a multiplication chart and a globe similar to that one, highly, highly recommend. Um, our students really like those, they've been very helpful. All right, just a few things left for you. One of the things that I found really helpful for my higher level students who are working through algebra skills, um, GED prep students, you know, learning how to graph linear equations, learning about slope isn't always the easiest thing. Um, the company called Hand to Mind uh, they have a great catalog with lots of resources. They have these pegboards, and I have it pictured in the top right here as well, but they have these pegboards 
they're kind of like geo boards that I remember from elementary school, but they have an X and a Y axis on them. They have these, these pegs and rubber bands that you can move around. My students have a lot of, uh, um, a lot of fun with those. So there's something for you. I also um, have XY grid whiteboards. So there's another thing if you're looking for something for helping with slope and graphing, uh, having a whiteboard is helpful with those lines already pre-drawn on there. Uh, we'd like to play coordinate point battleship. So if that's not something that you've thought of before, that can be really, really helpful uh, just for practicing plotting points. So that's something I would do before, like when I'm first introducing what the coordinate grid is. We'll play this battleship where they have to name points back and forth. Oh my goodness. I've laughed so hard watching people play that game. They get so into it. <laughs> so I know for sure I've shared that in the resources. So if you're teaching math and you're teaching uh, uh, graphing things, try that out. It's very fun. There's also some, uh, just a few online games that I have found, ones that you maybe might have a student play if they were at a computer. Um, but think about how you could maybe, if you have a projector in your room, how you could project that onto your whiteboard, project that on your screen. And then at least for us, we have wireless mice for our laptops, um, passing that mouse around and giving them control of the mouse. I mean, as a teacher-student relationship, you should have a little bit of trust, right? And a little bit of um, respect for each other. I never have any doubt that my student is going to do anything if I hand them this mouse. I mean, what are they going to do? I'm standing right next to them. You know, they've got the mouse controlling something on the screen that we can all see. I'm never worried about like the technology piece of that. It's really fun for them to have control of the computer, though. Because um, for so many of them, that's like completely off limits, right, while they're in prison. So for them to be able to control the mouse a little bit in class, plus it's cool when they can all see what each other is doing. Um, the one game I like to play especially is a high-low game with cards. Uh, so I'll put it up on the screen and then they have to press whether the next card's gonna be higher or lower. So just giving them the mouse, giving them control over that is really fun. Um, I have just a couple iPad games that I play. I threw that on there. I don't have anything really specific to add, but I wanted just to throw out online and iPad games in, in case you all had something that you're dying to share, like, hey, there's this cool iPad app that I use all the time. Um, feel free to, to throw that out there. A lot of what I use iPad games for are flashcards. Uh, there are some fraction apps that I use. I don't use them all that often. Um, Kahoot, yeah. And I just haven't gotten so much into iPads. Some of my colleagues um, have, have been more comfortable with that. Um, we do have to be careful with iPads, of course, they're on the internet. So just like online stuff and computers, be very careful with what we're allowing our students to do. If you don't know already, iPads and Apple products have what's called guided access. And that allows for um, you to lock the student into a particular app. So let's say you put them into the Space Flashcards app. You triple click the home button and all of a sudden all they can get into is that app, they can't access anything else. And in fact, if there was a part of the screen that you didn't want them to be able to click on, maybe there's a menu or something at the top you don't want them to be able to access, you just circle that before you put them into guided access and that part of the screen is disabled. So um, there's a lot of options. If your site, if you're at a correctional site um, and you're exploring the idea of tablets or iPads, just know that's a really good option for iPads. It's given us a lot of freedom to be able to do uh, lots of things with iPads. Mm, Mathagon. I don't know if I've heard of that one before. Someone threw out the Mathagon website. Quizzes, I know um, a lot of people have mentioned that too. That's a great website. You guys are throwing out some really good things. I hope you all are looking at the chat box as things are coming in. There's some good ideas out there. All right, a few more things to mention. Oh, thanks, Barb. She says, thanks for caring about your students so much. 
scavenger hunts. Uh, those are fun. I able to take our students outside. We're lucky that we're minimum security, right? So to get from the main building where they live over to education, they have to walk, I don't know, a couple hundred feet outside to get from door to door. So we do have the flexibility to go outside when it's nice out, um, which is not the winter time in North Dakota, unfortunately, but summertime, yes. <laughs> So circle scavenger hunt is what I have in the picture here. You can see how there's an answer at the top, then it gives you a question, and then you have to walk around and find the answer to that question. Just fun things like that. Tic-tac-toe review games. I just did this on Wednesday as well. We just went back and forth with questions. Um, team X, team O, they get it right. They put an X on the board. If they get it wrong, well, they lose that turn. So the X and the O's can, can go um, pretty quickly in that game. Just another fun way to make reviewing a little more interesting. Um, if you need like a little bit more than what I've said about it, feel free to just Google that. And I'm sure tic-tac-toe review game, you'll find some rules and some better explanation. Um, I wanna be cognizant of time. I think we have about 10 minutes left. So I wanna make sure we mention all of this to you. Uh, Mazes are great for kind of multiple choice questions. Some of the mazes I've used are equation mazes, giving them a start question and they have like three options of what the answer might be. So instead of just a regular old multiple choice worksheet, now they have something fun where, okay, here's the question and which way am I going to go from there? It's still four choices to pick from, but it's way more engaging and interesting than just a regular worksheet. Um, area and perimeter matching puzzles. Matching puzzles could be done for lots of things. I mean, so many of the things we've mentioned today are kind of about matching. I can show you some of these. Again, I didn't create these. I think I found these on Teachers Pay Teachers. Um, so if you want them, feel free to browse Teachers Pay Teachers. Um, searching for matching puzzles, I'll bet you find a bunch of them. Uh, there's two different types of pieces that come in the kit. And this one had three different types of questions, all based on area and perimeter. Get it the right way for you. So you have a bunch of answer cards, you have a bunch of question cards, and at the end, you have to be able to match them all up. Yes, another fun card game is I have who has. I haven't gotten so much into playing that, um, but I have found one that I did once upon a time. So if if that's comfortable for you, absolutely. I have who has is good too. Yep. So these are fun. Again, each of these had about a dozen questions in the set. They had to match them up. All right, um, integers. So teaching positive and negative numbers. I have a PowerPoint that I've shared in the resources that utilizes um, a car driving on a number line, going in different directions and turning around, going in reverse for subtracting and for negative numbers. And one of my students, and I'm like, why didn't I think of this? But he suggested, well, why don't you just bring in some matchbox cars for us and we can practice on the number line on our desk. This was amazing. You've got to try this. You've got to bring in some matchbox cars and let adult men practice moving on a number line with cars. Oh my goodness, our classroom had so many car engine noises going. It was, it was a riot, it was great. <laughs> so if your students are struggling with adding and subtracting with the positive and negative numbers, absolutely try cars on a number line. That's great. <laughs> I think I shared a couple different escape room options with you um, in the resource file. I don't particularly care for as many of like the Google slide type of escape rooms. There's a, several of those that I've seen out there. I, it, the technology pieces just don't work as well for us, um, but there's plenty of them that are just printed kind of like worksheets. And escape rooms, if, you, if you're not familiar with them, um, you know, I ham it up a little bit, and, you know, every, all the students come in and then I shut the door and be like, you're locked in until you answer these questions. <laughs> Uh, but you basically, they get a worksheet. They have four or five questions they have to answer. A lot of times they're multiple choice. So when they have that code, 
from the first worksheet, then they come and give it to you. And if they have it correct, okay, here's level two. And if they can get all of those answers correct, okay, here's level three. All right, you've unlocked the door, you can leave for the day. And of course they love it if we really say, yeah, if you get the answers right, you can leave, you, you've escaped the room. Everybody loves it if they can leave five or 10 minutes early, right? <laughs> so um, try that out if you haven't already, just search for some escape rooms. Um, I think you'll have success with that. Uh, one other thing we've been using in our classroom, something fun that we found in the last few months, they're called boogie boards. They're kind of like whiteboards, except they have a screen. Um, see if I can get some on here so you can see it. You write on that and then you press the little button and magically it clears itself and goes away. These are really fun for students like giving answer responses even. My colleague has used them to say, okay, what do you think the right answer is? They might put it on their board and show it to the teacher kind of a thing. You can lose, use them in lots of different ways, right? You all are creative. The downside is that unlike a whiteboard, you can't just erase part of this. So for me, if they're doing a math problem and they do something incorrectly, it's kind of hardly they have to scribble it out or they have to start over. So, you know, be aware of that. They're fun, novelty, but do you have to remember that fact? <laughs> all right, ah, too much to share in too little time. Um, some of the challenges that we've done with our students, one that we really liked is building boats. Uh, we give them a, a group of household supplies, partner them up. They have to use those supplies and see who can build a boat that holds the most marbles. Again, we do kind of a pre-lesson on like buoyancy and those kinds of things. Um, spaghetti structures, I know I've shared that in the resources. And then paper airplanes is another fun one that we've done just kind of a hands-on lesson about um, aerodynamics. And then we gave them some library books about building paper airplanes and had them fly them. Another day that was like crazy. We went over to the kitchen, into the dining room, and we had different challenges like um, who can get it closest to the target, uh, who can fly it the straightest, those kinds of things. That, that was another really fun one. All right. Last slide for you today. I wanted to highlight some of the bulletin boards that we use that kind of bring that fun atmosphere into our classrooms. Uh, we have a word of the week and we have, have a pun of the week that I try very hard to change every week. Sometimes I'm not that good about remembering, but I do try. <laughs> um, just to get some extra vocabulary out there. And again, to just bring a smile to people's face with a little goofy, goofy joke. Um, one thing, oh, Rube Goldberg devices. Sorry, I'm jumping back to the chat. Rube Goldberg devices are great. I love bringing those in as little extra like videos at the end of class. Absolutely, students love those. I haven't actually built one with my students before, but I can see how that would be um, really well received. Um, so we have a one club board and that's what's in the bottom left corner. Again, I can't take credit for this. Uh, someone from Maryland had this idea and shared this with us a few years ago and we've been doing it ever since. I love it. It's a great way to celebrate student success. Um, you can see the two stars towards the top of the board are people who are in what's called the one club, meaning they've passed three of their tests and they have one test left to take. And then once they pass their last test, then their name gets moved down to the bottom with all of the rest of the graduates for that year. Um, really, really popular. It's been a success since we've been doing it probably about five years now. Um, and we do it at all of the sites, actually all of our prisons. So um, if nothing else, take that one club board idea uh, back to your classroom. It's a really cool way to rally around people um, and to support them through that last, through that last test. Um, the Bravo board is something that we use. It's a staircase. Mm. That's a good idea too. Mary said that they have like a staircase that shows them moving towards graduation. I love that idea too. Mm, okay. Lots of great ideas in the chat. I, can't, I don't wanna get distracted. 
Um, the Bravo board, yeah, is a way for students to recognize each other. Um, so like, hey, Joe, thank you for helping me with my homework today. It shows that you're a you know, respectful person. Um, and the, the last one that we just started and we haven't quite seen as much success with yet because we've just had it up for a month or two is a book recommendation board. And we're hoping that we can encourage our students to read a little bit more. Uh, so my colleague and I are both putting on the board what we're reading and if we recommend it, what the storyline is. Um, and then we have little book pockets and they can put their recommendations for books that they wanna read as well. So again, there's 5,000 bulletin board ideas out there online. I just wanted to share what we're doing and give you a little inspiration to think, um, think outside the box maybe. All right, so that is about all that I had for you. If you have any other fun lesson ideas, please don't hesitate, throw them into the chat box. I really appreciate the sharing that you all have done so far. It's really encouraging. Like I said, here is where you can find those resources. Just go to that website that I have listed there. There should be a whole list of things that, uh, that you can click on. If you are looking for something that I mentioned today and you can't find it there, please feel free to email me. Um, like I said, I'm happy to collaborate. Um, happy to learn from everybody. All right, Emma, thanks so much. That was an awesome presentation. Um, I know my kids have been trying to get me to do the Diet Coke and Mentos uh, game forever, so maybe I might try that one. <laughs> yes. Uh, a word of advice is use warm pop. Warm pop, all right. So we learned that one. Don't use cold pop, use warm pop. Much bigger reaction. <laughs> Noted. Okay, my kids will be stoked on that. Much bigger reaction. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, I want to thank Dan again with Essential Education for making this webinar possible. Uh, thank you, Emma, for such an awesome presentation. Um, if everybody could just take a second to fill out the webinar poll that I just launched, that would be great. Um, as a reminder, this uh, presentation along with the materials will be posted to coabe.org uh, within about 24 hours of the completion of this webinar. And with that, Emma, if you have any final words, we'll, uh, we'll just close it out. No, I just wanna thank everybody for being here and for sharing. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Hope everybody has a great rest of the day and a great weekend. Thank you so much, bye-bye.